Yes, I would like to welcome you to our second meeting for this cohort five. Uh, I will be your facilitator, as Shamsuddin said, for this second chapter for names and values. Um, so I will talk about these parts within this chapter, or at least uh, mention concepts, which in my experience, I find them to be interesting. So I also want to strongly suggest everyone to interrupt me in case you have any questions from any of these parts uh, while we are going through them. Uh, so me or other members will have the opportunity to be challenged to answer any ambiguities and outside of our usual form of uh, how we think. In the first part, we learn like visually how binding works. And throughout this presentation, I will talk, uh, I will refer to this concept as either binding or assigning and sometimes referencing as well. Uh, but more importantly, we learn that uh, what is a valid uh, RNA. So this may be uh, trivial for us that this code is creating an object, a vector in this case, of three values, one, two, three, and then is assigning a name, uh, in this case, X to it. So I found this type of uh, uh, visualizations very interesting as it helps us understand what R internally does uh, when we are assigning a new object. Um, but what happens when we assign a second name to the same object? We learned that R does not produce uh, a copy at this level, uh, and this is for uh, memory optimizations. Instead, R puts a second reference, a second reference, but to the same object, which can confirm, we can confirm this uh, with this function, which is called object address within a package called Lobster. Uh, and as you can see, the output of both X and Y uh, is identical. And this is uh, what it means visually that uh, there is no copy, but there are two different names for the same object uh, and that there is a, a shared binding. So um, next in this part, uh, we uh, learn about valid R names or how to define proper names in order to receive not these kind of syntax error messages. Uh, of course, R lets us uh, use uh, letters, digits, dots, or underscores, uh, as long as you do not start uh, your variable names with underscore or digits. Um, also, it is not advised uh, uh, to use names uh, which are among uh, what is called in our language, uh, programming language as reserved words. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll receive an error. Of course, there is a way around it, uh, though in case, um, uh, just in case you like to challenge yourself or are not interested to be told what to do. Uh, and of course, it takes more work for presentation purposes. I only show uh, here two of these uh, forbidden names with, uh, within such characters, uh, which are called uh, backticks, I guess. So I think that this first part, the binding basis, basics was a smooth start to a more important subject, which is considering uh, different object types uh, and uh, when the action of copying occurs. So here we learn about the concept of copy and modify and how it, work, how it works differently um, in these different uh, scenarios. So going back to what we saw in the previous slides at this level, um, uh, we have uh, two different names that binds to one object, visually you can see here. Um, so uh, assigning uh, a different name does not produce an uh, object copy. But what happens to each of these assignments, uh, to each y and x, when we change a single value 
in one and but uh, but not the other one so here changing y does not affect x as you can see here uh, and actually um, at this point is where the copying of the object occurs um, visually you can also see it here that after changing the element within y uh, breaks this shared binding creates a new object and assign uh, y this new single uh, value. So this uh, this behavior is called copy on modify. Um, and he, here I just try to, to uh, investigate it with this uh, object address function. And as you can see, uh, the IDs for each of these X and Y are different and they are not identical anymore. So TraceMem is uh, introduced in the chapter in order to be able to trace when objects get copied. And as you can see here, um, um, the TraceMem is called for X, for the object X. And uh, X, uh, of course, is assigned uh, to, um, sorry, uh, when TraceMem is uh, called uh, on X, uh, we can see this um, ID for X and when you assign it to Y, uh, there is no copy, so there is no output of this uh, function trace mem. But um, when you change these elements, one element within uh, Y, trace mem tells us uh, uh, R is now created a second object after running the modification command. So modifying uh, Y again at this point will not produce another copy due to a concept which is called modify in place, but I will not talk about it here. Uh, we will get back to it by the end of the presentation, but this is also another way uh, for uh, memory optimization. Uh, same things happen when calling a function. Uh, let's see uh, what is happening here. Uh, so we define a, a function which is called f and which uh, accepts uh, an argument a. This function returns a as it is, which you can see here. So this is also a, a visual presentation, representation of uh, a, and I assume that these uh, like should be the pointers and uh, this is the environment in, which is created when the function is called. But I mean, the book also mentions that uh, we'll get the meaning of these conventions uh, later in the chapter. So for me, this kind of uh, presentation, uh, representations uh, stays as a hanging concept. So something that uh, is important, but I still do not have a clear idea. Um, but please jump in in case you have a clearer explanation for this kind of graph. Um, anyway, in the next line of the code, um, uh, what is happening here? Uh, a new vector of value is uh, assigned to x, and as you would expect, um, um, uh, yes, this uh, calling. Uh, the trace mem is uh, creating this uh, ID. Uh, but here, uh, when assigning a new name to this function, uh, here you cannot see any copy uh, created. But why? Uh, here we call uh, uh, the f function on x vector, which outputs x at is, at, as it is. Um, and assign a second name which is a z to it and visually uh, as before you can see this here and that's why uh, we do not see any copying being made here at this point <coughs> copy and modify concept is a bit uh, different in lists uh, as you see in the graph uh, lists are references um, uh, I think I can call them pointers as well, but anyways, they are not values uh, as we saw in the case of vectors. Uh, as before, memory optimization prevents uh, R to produce copies when 
there is a share binding when you assign a second name to the same object. Again, similar, uh, almost similar to vectors, copy and modify behavior is almost the same as in lists uh, with a minor difference. Uh, and as you can see here, um, uh, the values here, the values uh, are not copied, but the bindings are uh, with, of course, uh, this new value, which was applied to the second list and uh, a new uh, binding or a new reference to it. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So in this picture, in the bottom picture, the bindings still remain outside of the new object? Outside of four, so the bindings still remain for one and two, but three and four are their own, um, they're on their own. So for L1, this reference is different from this L2. Is that your question? I think so. So they, when you do copy or modify as different, it's different than on lists as, um, Vectors. Versus, versus vectors, exactly. You lose the bindings when you do new copy on, on vectors. But with lists, you can keep the bindings. Uh, the, as this picture makes it appear, one and two, the bindings remain, but three and four are, I guess, isolated. So yeah. Those objects are isolated. Maybe we can take a look at the bindings from the vector i mean maybe get, it's easier to explain this. that in, in in the list each uh each block is their own container so each block is their own vector also you would say so not not in in the right picture here not the list is uh, uh has the same binding each container has the same binding and in the bottom picture, you see that the containers have still the same bindings, except the last container, which now has a separate binding. So not yeah. the least is the same in the right picture. The, the containers are the same. Hannes, do you define container as each of the cells? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Is this, I mean, I guess that makes sense because lists can contain anything. Yeah, there is it exactly. Yeah, you don't have to, they, all, they don't have to be all the same class of object. Okay, that makes sense. Thank and I you. think, I mean, uh, this way with lists, it's again, much more uh, memory friendlier, if I can call it, when compared to vectors. I don't know if that is true or not. But, uh, okay, so, we can, um, maybe this also helps a little bit. Um, we can also look at the shared bindings uh, through this uh, reference function, uh, also from uh, Lobster package. Uh, and as you can see here in the output, uh, so this is the identifier for the list itself that has these uh, three uh, values. Um, and for L2, again, this is the I, I, different identifier. So they are not sharing anymore uh, the same IDs, but they are sharing uh, for these two, the IDs that are for these two and a different one for uh, the new values, which we have defined within the second lists. Um, so how does copy and modify works for data frames? I, you can you can think of a data frame as a, a list uh, of vectors um, which is defined uh, as columns. So for example, here um, uh, D1 has two columns, uh, X with three, these three values and Y with these three values. You can either modify columns or rows. Uh, of a data frame and the behavior of this uh, copy and modify is a little bit different in each of these cases. For example, here, um, 
First, we assign uh, D2 on the same data frame. And then uh, we want uh, all the rows within the second column to be multiplied by two. Um, since the first column is unchanged, the uh, references uh, are shared within these two uh, da data frames, uh, but for the second uh, data frame, uh, a, a new column or a new vector and a new reference uh, to it is created. But uh, once you want to make changes on the first row, on the first row of all the columns, uh, in this case, both of the vectors uh, needs to be assigned to new ones. Um, I mean, what is important here, in my opinion, is that um, column-wise calculations on uh, data frames uh, reserve uh, less memory compared to row-wise calculation. And uh, this can be specifically become very handy uh, when you are doing calculations on uh, huge data frames. <coughs> So finally, for uh, character vectors, um, as before, uh, this code uh, defines a, a vector with characters, uh, not individuals, as, uh, just as you defined them. Um, what I understood here is that with character vectors, uh, we, we can have shared bindings. OK, I, I can see that both from the reference and what we see visually. Um, but at least in my opinion, there was no clear definition of uh, how such a global string pool uh, is defined. Um, any ideas? So if not, I will um, call it my second hanging concept. So I will have to see if uh, this global string pool uh, concept will uh, comes up. Um, in... What do you mean, Hoda? What the question is? So, I mean, um, when you, it says that R has a global string pool. So does it mean that it has like all of these combinations and is waiting for, uh, like a, a character vector to be made, so just to re reference to it. Because visually what I see here is that within this vector, I do not see uh, these two characters, but it's still they are in the global string pool. So when were they defined? Or wh where do they come from? So I believe that, uh, you know, this is just an example, like in yeah. these characters must have been defined earlier and they are not shown it yet. Uh, so it's like whenever you create a, um, you know, a vector of characters, um, it's, I think it works like, a, you know, like in, they are occupying a memory and uh, they are just being referenced by, let's say here, X. So... Does this mean that every time you restart R, this global string pool is a different structure than? Yeah, so it will start, start with a blank slate and then keep on adding stuff as we create character vectors. So, I mean, it's a way of memory optimization, I would say that, like, uh, let's say Y was having, uh, you know, ABC and uh, XY. So, you know, things can be recycled there, like it can, uh, uh, you know, uh, locate uh, A and yeah. other stuff from this global string pool. Yeah, so um, Hoda was asking in particular, these kind of examples that are not um, uh, within the vector space, right? X, what bring them into the pool? Were they already predefined? Do we have uh, um, predefined combinations of character in pool some, somewhere like that? So I guess, as he Rahul said, maybe it's just for the purpose of example. If I'm no, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. If it's global, it just means that it's like available to any function or program, right? That that you call through R once it's been created. 
right? Mm, like, yes. That, that's what the global means rather than it being, you know, a pool that's within a, a function when a function is called. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the word globally uh, really defined now, uh, it makes sense now. So um, it can be assessed from everywhere. Okay. So are we finished? Yes. So it seems that I don't have any more um, slides on copium modify. So now we can uh, just move to the next part. Um, Let's see what I learned from object size. So first of all, it's just uh, very easily, uh, you can see what is the size of the objects you have created with this um, function from uh, lobster package. Um, but, uh, yes. A question, um, um, but first, why do we need um, to even check the object size? For instance, um, creating a variable, um, I do believe they don't take much memory and stuff like that. When do we um, need to make sure we check the object size so that it doesn't make any problem. Um, it doesn't change, it doesn't make any program? A problem or uh, what oh, is, problem. sorry. Yeah, yeah, problem. Uh, f- for instance, for me, I think um, for the normal size of the program, I write small, I mean, the object size doesn't matter. So when object size matters, when do that's we also, need to do that? That's, that's also my question as well. I mean, uh, at least, from uh, my point of view, as I was reading up until now, uh, I haven't been working like with very huge data frames that uh, uh, I had uh, the feel or the necessity to be careful with this uh, object size. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good practice, at least, I would say. Yeah, Debelina so. De- 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 said, <laughs> okay. Well, I'll give you an example. So. In my work, I had to calculate um, many rates for many geographies for many different groups of people. So I write a function and functions have like, as we saw in in that picture, like their own environments in which things are created. And my function had multiple in, had had to iterate over you know there was a, I had a data frame that had all the arguments in which it would just uh, map through each row of arguments. The data the function itself was creating a grouped DF, which is also I learned that you need to ungroup when you use group by and summarize in data frames. You you need to ungroup. <laughs> because group DFs are significantly larger than regular data frames because it holds the groupings. Um, And it was making my function significantly slower, like Uh significantly slower. When I checked, when I, I don't know if you know about the browser function, the the browser function that you put inside functions to see the internals. When I looked inside my uh, scoped, like in of the function, I was seeing like many data objects, like data frames or many objects in general that were, were like a hundred megabytes and it was slowing down my, and when I just do these like very mundane, like little trivial things, like uh, on like ungrouping my data frame, my function ran like so much faster. Um, so for me, like, I've learned my lesson that I always try and check my object sizes, especially with it when I'm writing functions and especially, you know, if those functions are going to be deployed, uh, like in a shiny app, for example, um, then that would really uh, decrease the user experience. Yes, thank you, Leila, for the clarification, but I mean, anyway, from this part, as I understood, is that um, uh, you can barely guess just by yourself uh, the correct answers of uh, how much space uh, your object that uh, you are creating is going to take uh, uh, our memory. Um, Because um, 
I mean, apart from the fact that, uh, as Leila was uh, mentioning, it depends on like uh, what type of things you are uh, asking uh, R to create for you. Uh, somehow, at least in my opinion, it also depends on like your R version, or it uh, possibly also depends on uh, elements and uh, their types uh, within each of the objects. And of course, do not forget that. Um, <clears throat> Here, for example, uh, what uh, function that you use, uh, because at least in my opinion, within one of the examples, uh, this uh, object size from Lobster works uh, better when compared to this ones from the uh, utils package. Um, I mean, um, as I mentioned, what I uh, would like to take as a message is, uh, first of all, um, if you want to advance in R programming, the size of the objects uh, uh, I am creating should be of importance, uh, but I do not have to like to use uh, like my uh, fingers to add up numbers rather than there are tools and it is my responsibility um, uh, to think um, what uh, type of tools uh, I'm going to use. Um, yes. Uh, I think that's what all what I wanted to say and uh, Leila put it very nicely with the example she explained from her experience. <coughs> uh, so we learned uh, about uh, copy and modify, um, but what is the concept of uh, modify in place? So I will try to tell you what I learned from this part of this chapter through single binding and um, a bit uh, touching the concept of environments. <coughs> so if a name uh, is referenced to a single object, changing the same object as you can see here, um, Uh, does not actually produce a copy. Uh, like V here is uh, bound to a vector and changing elements from the same vector applies uh, uh, the same within the same uh, object. Uh, yet again, as uh, with the object sizes, um, predicting this uh, behavior that this uh, uh, modifying in place uh, is a little bit difficult. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but uh, the book uh, verbally suggests to keep track of it by means of uh, uh, defined functions such as uh, what we saw as in the case of tracemem. Uh, I also remember there was like this example of a for loop. Um, of course, I didn't put it in the slides. Uh, but maybe we can get back to it through the exercises and uh, understand more uh, about the concept of uh, modify in place. Modifying in place uh, also happens for environments, uh, which I will also touch briefly. Um, an environment, an environment um, can be a container uh, of different objects and different variables. Uh, of course, making it is um, uh, very easy here um, in this example, an environment is created using uh, n function uh, with these three variables. Um, if we assign a second name to this environment, um, sorry, there will be no copy, but um, here, uh, this pane, uh, changing one value, changing one value in one of them changes the same value um, in the second one as well. Um, somehow this can is can also... Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? It, it makes this, it copies in both places? Uh, it doesn't make a copy. So this is like modify in place. Oh. So I think this is somehow uh, related, could be related to the uh, huge uh, memory that an environment can take up. 
uh, and uh, that's why their behavior is defined uh, to be modified in place. Does this make sense? I think so. So, I mean, uh, I know this is like a very trivial example. Uh, environments, in my opinion, are like these huge containers that are taking up a lot of memory. So um, once you assign uh, a second name to it, um, of course, just like in the case of the vectors, uh, there's only a new reference uh, and uh, no copying is uh, occurring. So here in this example, uh, C from E1, if you change this to a new value, if you check the, your second assignment, uh, this is also changed. Um, the assignment to it is also changed because somehow, I, I don't know, R prefers uh, to work with environment this way. Um, and I think okay. it's only um, uh, uh, like copying uh, uh, this huge environment only through this uh, minor changes, a little bit memory inefficient, if you consider it that way. But if you guys have any other uh, experience with environments, maybe you can jump in and explain a little bit better. Okay. So, um, I mean, um, uh, this, uh, the book also mentions that uh, it will also talk about the environments in the later chapters as well. But just uh, here, it, it just wanted to point out that uh, um, uh, this uh, modify in place is also happening for environments, unlike what we saw in the case of character vector, unlike what we saw in the case of uh, the lists and vectors, and at least I assume that this could be uh, due to memory inefficiency. So maybe we can get back to it later during the chapters. So for the last part, I also want to mention some stuff quickly about unbinding in a garbage collector. It's just that here in this example, we create a sequence of numbers and then we assign it to X. Uh, using the same name, uh, but for a new sequence, we'll make R to remove the previous binding and assign uh, X to this uh, new sequence that uh, we have created. Um, but removing X, uh, unbinds uh, all the assignments. And here in uh, internal R memory, now we have these two objects which are unassigned. And uh, this part of the book was trying to say that uh, R actually takes care of its own garbage as we all hopefully do at home. You can read about uh, these uh, R objects or um, uh, in this article. <clears throat> so uh, this is actually for my part. Um, I'm sorry, I was a little bit tired and totally unfocused. Uh, I, but I still, I hope that uh, you were able to get uh, some of the ideas throughout these uh, different concepts for this um, chapter. Uh, each of these parts, of course, uh, they, they put like some, uh, exercises that uh, we can now go through with them. Uh, I think that I only didn't have uh, enough time to put this uh, part five uh, questions, but uh, I hope that uh, in case we have time, we can just go through them throughout the book. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can always ask questions in the Slack. Um, so I really would suggest you just to start uh, trying to do the exercises. I think at one point I also do have the answers here, but let's just uh, do all of this. I mean, if you have any idea about this question, please come in and help me with it. I'm already losing my voice, sorry. So here in this example, we, um, 
we are creating this data frame. Um, so I think that according to the uh, standard names, maybe you can now uh, tell me uh, how you can define a third column, calling it three, and uh, assign this to be like uh, the sum of the, uh, the first two columns. Any ideas? Like, why do you think that um, uh, three can be a very challenging uh, as variable names? Um, because three is a number? Yes. It's a defined, it's already defined. So then you would be defining number three as something else? Yeah, would, so for this question, you'd need to use back ticks on it because just three by itself is like like you said already defined as a number oh uh, yes yeah. so now i'm sorry i just uh, started to see some of the uh in your chat the string pool oh, how do you mean hannes how how can this help us to understand the string pool uh, is this the, the, if, the one that you were talking about, or? Uh, no, that, that's more the global string pool. Um, if you run this code, you will see that um, the object size for the x1, x1 mm -hmm. and x0 will be exactly double of the single object size. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. each, each one has their own memory object. So, yeah. In the second example, I use strings, but it's it's actually the same string. And so the object size for both together is lower because uh, y2 will access the global string pool. I have to apologize. I really thought that you were talking about this, that we were oh, no. that's but, uh, that, That's already answered the back ticks, so. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. As I think, um, Rahul, did you, did you say that? I'm sorry, I missed the, who was uh, talking. But anyways, um, thank you. Um, so three is exactly a number and is one of the uh, invalid uh, characters, uh, invalid names uh, within R. And then with the support of backticks, uh, you're absolutely possible to overcome the problem. So for the first, uh, for the second question, um, so it is asking us actually the, to understand uh, this object size uh, in the case of lists, when you have like these huge vectors. Do you think that whatever X is Y is going to be like triple size of it, or when I originally saw this question, that's what I thought that it would be triple the size. Mm -hmm. But I after, think it would be the same. But they're the same because Y is just pointing at it three times. Yeah. Mm. They're like individual because it's a list. So those, those are individual containers and each container is holding X, which is that number. No. And so it's just the same. No, that's true. I mean, the difference is, yes, only is uh, how much a list is going to take like with these three elements. So for the next exercise, um, it's, uh, it's uh, related to the concept of uh, modify and copy and modify, sorry. Uh, and uh, it's asking us to uh, know on which of these lines um, A gets copied. 
you can just answer with two or three and if you have like any further explanations. I'm looking at it, it looks like it's the third line, right? Because on the first line, it's created with the reference. On the second line, when you assign it to B, B and A still have that same reference. But then when you change B, yeah. on the third line, you have to copy it. And then yeah. you can make that modification. Yeah, just as we, <coughs> as we saw in the case of uh, modification on copy. So these were the quizzes at the beginning of um, the chapter. I think the rest of the exercises is going to be a little bit more challenging. Wait, Adrian, did you say the third line? Yeah, the third line, because on the second, it's not like, like remember the, the first example of like X and Y, how they still point mm -hmm. to the same thing? Mm -hmm. um, you haven't copied it yet, but then when you make the change on the third line, Gotcha, then you gotcha. need to make the copy before. That makes sense. Yeah. And I just want to see if this works as well. I mean, if you want to also visualize it, <laughs> let's just see. This is my first time. So A is um, on the first line. A is pointed to these four elements. And uh, with the second line, we are only assigning the same object and assigning it to the second name. So there's no copy here. But as soon as uh, you try to change uh, the first element, this, um, there should be an eraser somewhere, yes this assignment is um, unbind and B gets to have a second one with a new value in the first place. Does this help? Yes, thank you. Okay. Oh, shit. So uh, now again, um, it is asking us to explain uh, in this exercise, uh, we need to try to explain the relationship between um, these uh, names in the following code. So I think that you can also annotate this. Uh, is this possible for you? I don't know if it's can anyone try to see if uh, there's a possibility to annotate my screen share? Yes, the Blina is doing something. Hello. Yes. Do you want to go ahead, the Blina? Sure, I can give it a shot. Um... Uh, so A creates the object with numbers 1 to 10, B points to the same reference as A, C points to the same reference uh, as B, and then D, I believe, is like a separate thing. So um, A, B, C, same identifiers, D, different. Yes. Um, so this is also from the exercise book, which I think is also a cool way not to repeat this. Um, trying to look at the object addresses of all of these uh, names, you can see that uh, truly A, B and C are identical and uh, D is a different thing. Okay. So uh, the second question is asking us uh, that within this following code, uh, which is trying to access the mean function in multiple ways, do they all point to the same underlying function, uh, which we can of course 
uh, again, verify this with uh, the object ad address. I think that Lino wants to answer again. I'll let somebody else go. Sorry, I was just turning up the <laughs> annotation. No problem. Um, so I guess we are referencing the same object mean, right? Um, so we have not make any modification by just assessing um, the fun the mean whether it is object, yeah. So I think nothing can happen. But for this, do they all have, yeah, they do have the same thing because there is nothing or modification on the mean. Um, that's what I thought too. I mean, these are all different methods to call the mean function, right? So, I mean, as long as they belong to the same, um, they should always produce uh, identical IDs as well. So um, by default, base R data import uh, functions like read CSV, uh, which will automatically convert non-syntactic names to syntactic ones. Uh, why might this be problematic? And uh, what option allows you to suppress this behavior? I mean, if you have already worked with this. I mean, I personally never use read CSV. Uh, I use read uh, underscore CSV. I think this is from read R package. And I'm not sure if the arguments, the arguments should also be the same. Sh or sorry, they should be like different as well. But I mean, if you have used like read.csv, if you had like the same problem, like maybe you could just. So some data when it comes, they are not non-tidy. Uh, the column name sometimes may be part of the data we have. So um, it will be problem when we have some column name, which is obviously part of the data to uh, uh, change it to, um, even if it is non-synthetic, uh, to change it to synthetic. So I think that's maybe the problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's true. That's, I think, uh, uh, what this uh, exercise is trying to point it uh, as well. So it seems that within this uh, function, there is like this make names function, which does the transformation, uh, like by default. And if you want to avoid it, uh, you can just set it to false. I mean, yeah. I also like to just see uh, what yeah. is the data frame, what are the actual names and everything. And I think that uh, this would be a smart way to uh, read your data, specifically the ones that are not made with or, or you got it from someone else. So the function makes names um, when it automatically, uh, the read the CSV has this makes names by default to be true, I guess, right? Yeah. So what I thought uh, from this. yeah, the makes names is non imbatible <laughs> So we cannot transform back to the previous um, yeah. So it, it's really um, problematic. So we should avoid it and check this. Mm -mm -mm. That's true. Can you pass in instead like a vector of new names that you would want to use? So like just before seeing what the data frame is, you're asking if it is yeah. possible to... I mean, I don't see why it is... Yeah, you possible, can. But... So the first argument for name, sorry. I, yeah, you sure. Know, I just took this, the is a character vector to be coerced to syntactically valid names. So mm -hmm. you can force it. Force it to what? So if they are non-syntactical names and uh, you, they're you said, too public. Check that names equals to false, right? You just said this um, argument. I thought Leila was mentioning that uh, she can just, uh, wa at the point that she wants to import the data frame, ah. to define the column names. Is that I correct? See. Yeah, that's what I was saying. So it could be uh. problem. 
So to address why it could be pro problematic, you can make you can pass make dot names a vector of names that you would that would be non problematic. If that makes sense. I mean, I personally would really, as I mentioned earlier, is just that to see the data frame in uh, the R environment and try to like clean the, the even the column names uh, as part of the wrangling. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't see why you cannot do it uh, if you have like, uh, if you're like 100% sure of uh, the column names and everything. Yes, I think that is possible, absolutely. <clears throat> so again, going back to the make, make names for uh, this uh, read.csv, it is asking us to see uh, what rules. Yeah, I think there were like different type of rules uh, that will make the make names to activate on the column names. Um, I think it would be like meaningless and wasting time just to wait to remember what we have studied. I never like memorizing this stuff. So um, uh, I put here like uh, what is considered as a valid name to the make names. Um, As far as, um, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you can use dot, but while there is no number afterwards. Is that correct? Yes. So as long, and it's, so it's in, the, in the vignette, it says, Syntactically valid name consists of letters, numbers, and the dot yeah. or okay. underlined characters and yeah. starts with the letter or the dot not followed by a number. Mm. Which in, in this case, I think that it will be replaced by an X. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so there are also, um, Non-valid characters, for example, the at signs, um, which uh, make names also try to uh, revert it maybe to some other names like X or something else. Uh, but also uh, the column names should not be of reserved words. Uh, okay, so um, in uh, in this exercise, I remember that uh, from the answers, uh, this popped up that uh, some of these transformations are influenced by the current locale. Um, I do not understand what this locale means. Is it like uh, where you have downloaded your R version or? So this means that it could be different from different CRANs or any idea? At least to my understanding, the locale is um, like the actual digits on your computer. So I believe like one of them is like um, UTF-8 and that's like a standard keyboard uh, that you might have, but some people might have like a Japanese keyboard where there are extra letters. And so I think this is just trying to um, like wherever your default system is, that's what R is going to use as a default locale. Um, yeah, I've run into some issues sometimes where some of the, uh, like the an apostrophe from online might uh, not translate well to R, like it might not recognize it in the column name. And so I'll have to like force uh, the actual locale on it so that it uh, mm -hmm. recognizes. Says get locale. Uh, okay, thank you, Deblina. Thank you, Adrian, as well. So the local we normally use traditionally is UTF-8, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think this is the standard. Yeah. No. 
Okay. So in this exercise, um, the question is why this name is not a syntactic names. I mean, I think that also uh, here is mentioned by Lila, it's just that after dot, um, if it is followed by numbers, it is not considered as valid. Um, but also here in the answer, it's just saying that it, uh, it will also be considered as uh, a double. And I was wondering, like, for example, if a column name is a double, could it have like an effect on the calculations that you're doing on a column? And this is why this is unacceptable. Any experience? No. I mean, uh, I have had experience with, uh, you know, time series analysis and all. So one problem that I, you know, mostly face is that uh, when I'm, let's say, pivoting a data set to become wider, you know, it has a series of, uh, 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 let's say, years, like 2018, 2019, and then it becomes, you know, column names. So, you know, and X is automatically appended in the beginning of it so that it's not really, a, you know, a number. So, you know, or a double, that happens a lot. Yep. Okay. So maybe it would be good just to move forward a little bit. I, I just see that we're already over time. Yeah, we are over time. <laughs> I think yeah, um, maybe we can keep asking questions, maybe in the channel, um, if someone has a question for, the remaining exercises. Um, so as you can see, people started to run. <laughs> we also yeah, have, we already have, so we have one hour dedicated for the uh, call and yeah. the exercises, if we go through some and we have some to finish, then we can keep chatting in the channel if you have questions. I think um, that will uh, make things more uh, enjoyable and lively. Um, so for the next uh, presenter, um, uh, I think I will share the GitHub. We have the, I share the GitHub channel. If you see the GitHub channel, um, there are some quite slides for the previous session. Someone can just um, have a look at the uh, folder called presentations and just look at the um, presentation there. And um, we obviously, okay, for the next presenter, what we do sometimes we uh, do live coding so if you are comfortable with live coding, but it's not necessary, um, you can uh, actually do, as you demonstrate in the slides, you also demonstrate in the live coding so that we can uh, interact much better because some people right now, they are doing uh, practicing in their <laughs> uh, live. So yeah, so I think um, this is a nice session by Hoda and the first and the good one. Um, thank you very much, Hoda. Uh, yeah, so we see next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, uh, thank you very much, Hoda. Uh, we see next week at the same time. Uh, I think next week is not the same time, right? <laughs> we have one hour. As far as yeah. I remember, it's supposed to be one hour. But okay. yeah, yeah. Next week um, is one hour less. So we meet at, um, yeah, one hour less. So without much further ado, I can say, all right, see you next week and have a good uh, week. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, thanks. Ciao.